in terms of Joan Hickson's Marple, I think what makes it such an enduring version of, of the stories is not only Joan herself, but also the look and feel of each episode or sort of small film. So I'm delighted to be joined by a production designer who worked on the last two of Joan's Marples. I would like to introduce Alan Spaulding. How are you? I'm good, thank you very much. And, and how are you in these rather odd times? Well, I'm, I'm quite happy, you know. In, <laughs> I do look, I've got a reasonable sized house and a biggish garden and, and, and the heath out the back of the back gate. So we're kind of uh, quite happy to be locked, locked away. We're getting a bit bored. I've done all the jobs now. Yes, I know the feeling. There's only so much you can do. And, but in terms of Miss Marple, as I say, you worked on the last two, but were you aware of uh, that it was happening and had you seen any of it before working on the series? I'd seen some of them, yes. I don't think I've seen them all, but I've seen some of them. I mean, as you say, it was a, a successful strand and, and it was very popular. I think the ones I did went out, certainly over the Christmas breaks, that's kind of feature the feature film length um, shows to, to quite large audiences, particularly even for, for the time I think they got large audiences. And, and had you read any of the books or was it sort of totally new to you? I read the books when I knew I was doing the programme. Um, and yes, I did. They were, they, were, they were a kind of genre in their own right really. Um, they don't, they don't give that many clues away for the designer because as, as books, they're more sort of written as kind of puzzles, really, solvable puzzles. So, you know, they don't actually get very little visual description in the book. When you've not only got a script, but I say the books, where do you start? You read the book and then see what the script adds or, or well, vice versa? Well, the, 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 they do it with mirrors. We didn't have a script to start. So we, we actually searched the locations on, from the book. And I, I worked with the, the location manager and we worked out a list. And the thing with all, most, you know, 90% of productions, there'll be a key location. And once you've found that key location, and everybody's happy with that key location, you then can start looking for the, the, the subsidiary locations. And ideally, if they're within striking distance of the key location, it makes the logistics far more feasible. In this case, we found this, well, they do it with mirrors. The key location was the house, um, which, was a, which was a kind of school for sort of um, delinquent boys. Once we found that, that was, you know, we then started looking for the other, other requirements, the railway line and the stations and whatever. Looking at them, there is very little studio work across the whole series. Was that common for the time or was it particularly special for the series? It wasn't. It, it, well, they, were, they were shot on film. Um, so the, the studio, you don't need to use the studio because it's single camera. Um, it, it was, if the location worked, there was no need to go into a studio. In, in fact, on the the mirror crack from side to side, we did quite a lot in the studio um, because Miss Marple's house was in it. And this, despite the fact it was the last episode, her house had never actually been in it before. They'd had her garden and the back of the house, which was one location. And they had the front of the house, which was another location. And architecturally, the two houses were quite different. So when we needed to, to have a, a front room and a dining room and a kitchen and a, and a parlour, as a composite set, it was actually quite difficult because the two two locations didn't match in any way at all. As you say, her house had been glimpsed or parts of it. Do you go back and see what has been established or do you almost sort of start afresh? No, you try to go back to where, it was, where it's established. Um, and the, the village was Nether Warwick, which is in Wiltshire. So and then the things that were made for the village, like the market cross and the, there was a, a kind of Celtic cross, they were, we had to make those again because um, so there's a continuity across the series. 
are you sort of more involved in dressing and, and sort of tailoring a location to fit as opposed to designing from scratch? Well, it, it varies really. I mean, the, the finding the location is part of the design. So once you've got what you feel happy with, um, if, if the room works the way it's furnished, then run with it. Um, on the, on the, the do it with mirrors, we, the house actually was pretty well furnished. We had, to, we had to do an office, which wasn't there, but the living room had kind of sofas, lived in sofas that you would never have been able to find at a hire company. They had a you know, level of comfort and distress. And so, yeah, it was perfect. And things like paintings, the paintings were in the house, but it's, it's, it, it varies really. Um, on the, the mirror crack from side to side, there was a big house near um, Ringwood. And um, we did a lot of dressing there. We built, we built a bathroom inside one of the bedrooms and um, we dressed the dining room, we dressed the living room, dressed the bedrooms. So essentially all you had there was the house, all of the actual dressing was all higher. So it, it depends really whether, you know, on, on what's required or as to what you do. Really. And you know, as you said, you know, you're involved with finding the location. These were all sort of, you know, TV movies really. What sort of lead up time did you have? Was it quite last minute or did you have the flexibility to plan no, it? Was, it was a decent run up time. I mean, we, we went initially for locations, we went um, down, down as far as Devon and across into I mean, what, I, what I do is a lot of refer homework before I start. So I go through books and it was, it was, it, it was essentially a Victorian country house. So finding out how many of the Victorian country houses that are still around and are still available. A good deal of them have become care homes or conference centres or national trust or whatever. So the, well, down to there weren't actually that many. So we went down to Devon, we went to Nottinghamshire and finally settled with this house in Shropshire where this lady was in her 90s and had really lived there most of her adult life. And she lived alone except for a butler. And the place was time locked. It was perfect. I mean, that must be a, a rarity to find somewhere effectively already dressed. Yeah, well, yes, yeah, it is. But I did, I did work on a Silas Marner and we found the same um, a house that hadn't changed for hundreds of years. And that's now National Trust, so probably not got the same quality it had at the time. But looking at your, your so wider work, you're no stranger to period settings. Was the setting for Marple quite an interesting era to research and design? It, it is interesting. It's quite, the thing about Miss Marple is it's kind of England remembered. It's sort of set in the 50s, but it's actually got quite a kind of pre-war feel to it. Um, so you, when it comes to kind of cars and trains and all the kind of things, and you put them into period. But the general feel about it is this sort of cosy England remembered rather than, you know, 100% accurate 1950s. And so does that give you a little bit more artistic license then and, and to be able to push it a little? Yes, so uh, it's, um, it's a subtle thing. You know, you wouldn't, um, you know, in the end, you don't, you don't want to go sort of over the top, make it too theatrical or too, um, I mean, we did have sets on the mirror crack from side to side where it, they had to be quite modern for the time. So that's again quite um, less straightforward. Because as part of this event, I'd spoken to the producer and he was very keen to have the same crew on each production. So coming in for the first one, was, was it all very welcoming or was it sort of a case of you, you get on with it? Yes, no, I think well, it was, there wasn't any, any issues. Um, I mean, designer works principally with the director, and the, the director was, it was his first one as well, so um, it wasn't, you know, he was coming into it as a, as a new kid on the block. So um, I have not any problems. And of course, for both of them, it was directed by Norman Stone. Had you worked with him before? Well, only as a student. And we did a film together in the, 
1970 for the students. So was it totally by chance then that you found yourselves working together yeah, on this? Absolutely. It was. And, and then, because I say you did both with him, that must have become quite a strong sort of working partnership and, and quite a shorthand you had together. Yes, I think so. I mean, he was the cameraman, John Walker, he had done a lot. So he was quite, and he was quite a strong personality. So he tended to kind of drive the, um, a lot of the shooting style. And, um, there were sort of, you know, Norman and he didn't always agree. And, and as we touched upon, you know, a lot of it was done on location. I assume you would have actually been there for a lot of the filming on a day-to-day -day basis, or were you working ahead all the time? Generally working ahead, very uh, uh, the standby art directors there on a daily basis, production designer, usually working ahead, trying to set up the next setup. Even if it's on the same location, you're often dressing the rooms that are needed you know, later on in the, in the schedule, um, and popping back to board. I tend to try and be on the set beginning of the day and at the end of the day just to make sure everybody's happy. But you, know, you can't be everywhere at once. But one interesting, um, on the, I think it was, we do it, we do it with mirrors, we had to have a, a train arrival scene at a country station. And we ended up shooting it on the um, North Summer, I think it's called the North Somerset Railway. And because there was a director who wanted this particular shot where the people got off the train and went and got on a, in, into a car. So it all had to have a kind of flow to it. But we, the station was quite boring. So we ended up doing a lot of construction work on it. And, and also, also the trains, when they didn't have a turntable, the train was going to come in backwards. So we ended up having to take the train off the track put it onto a lorry, drive the lorry round a roundabout, and then put it back onto a track, just to make the train come the right way, the engine to come the right way down the line. And then when they got off the train, we, you could, they had an exit, but you couldn't track the camera and the people through the same small exit. So we had to take the fence down and they had a prop man dressed in the period costume, who then had to replace the fence back into the shot after the camera had gone past. It was <laughs> quite a tricksy location for a fairly simple sequence. I suppose that must be the, the joys of, of being on location. You've just got to deal with what works for you, I suppose. Yes. I mean, I, I, mean, I mean, strangely enough, subsequently, I have come across railway stations where we wouldn't have had to do quite that much work. And sometimes, sometimes you, you, what you find is, is you, um, because of the, the schedule and, and the logistics, that the location will end up getting more and more complicated because you can't, it has to, you know, the time's run out when you can shoot it and you haven't found it. Um, and again, on the, we do it with mirrors, we ended up going to this um, house to be the Savoy Hotel and more or less rebuilding the whole the corridors and bedrooms because I had good reference of the Savoy Hotel which isn't like that anymore. Um, but it became almost kind of ex the expedience of, of the schedule kind of dictated what we had to do. And I suppose we, we can't talk about Marple without actually mentioning Joan Hickson. Would you have had much to do with her on set? Um, not, not a huge amount. I mean, she's always very professional, very charming, and she's very friendly. She, she liked to chat when she wasn't on camera or on rehearsing, she liked to chat with the crew. And so I did, and also I did meet her socially quite a few times. So, you know, she was, she was so perfect for the part that it wouldn't have been you know, the same without her. It was kind of almost, and I think, if I remember, the, the, the Agatha Christie family felt the same. You know, they felt that she was kind of um, so perfect. That people were very happy with the whole, the whole set up. Your last Marple was actually the last of, of all of the films. Was yeah. there a sense that that was something special? You know, what was sort of the atmosphere working on that one? Well, I don't know that we knew that at the time. I, I, can't, I didn't know that. 
Um, and you know, this is going to be the last, cause, you know, with the kind of the way things are commissioned, you know, they often say, oh, this is the last book or the last one, and you know, and another one's found, and another one. And so I didn't know that it was the last book. Because I suppose at this point, would you be in BBC staff, so sort of just allocated to it? Um, sort of. Yes, you were allocated, but you were also, um, producer choice was kind of creeping in. And I'd, I'd, only, I'd just been nominated for two BAFTAs, so I was kind of desirable, I suppose. Looking back, in terms of all the various incarnations of Marple, Joan Hickson's is often looked upon as the most authentic or the, or the favourite. What do you think makes that particular version so enduring? Well, I think because of Joan Hickson, really. I think she is so perfect, perfect casting. That that's what, you know, it worked so well. Um, I've not, I haven't really seen the, any of the recent ones. But it's the same with Poirot on ITV, I think. The thing is usually was was well cast, but, you know the character. I think if you get if you get that right, then the rest falls into place. On that lovely note of, of Joan, I just like to say thank you very much for your time, Alan. It's been absolutely fascinating. Good, that helps. Right, take care.